Hello, everyone. Welcome to the special CUBE conversation. We're here in Palo Alto, California, the CUBE headquarters. I'm John Furrier, the co-founder of SiliconANGLE Media, co-host of the CUBE. We're here with a fellow cloud influencer, friend of the CUBE, Sarbeet Johal, who's uh, always on Twitter. If you check out the, my Twitter stream, you'll find out we've always got some threads. He's always jumping in the crowd chat. And I think was the in the leaderboard for our last crowd chat on multi-cloud Kubernetes. Thanks for coming in. Yeah, thank you for having me here. Thanks for coming in. So you're very prolific on Twitter. We love the conversations. We're getting a lot of energy around some of the, the narratives that have been flowing around. Obviously helped this week by the big news of IBM acquiring Red Hat for, what was it, 30, what was the number? 34, 34 yeah. 34 billion dollars, huge premium. Essentially changing the game in open source, some think, some don't. Uh, but it begs the question, you know, cloud obviously is relevant. Ginny Rometty, the CEO of IBM, actually now saying cloud is where it's at. 20% have been on the cloud, 80% have not yet moved over there. Um, trillion dollar market, which we called, actually I called years ago when I wrote my fourth post about Amazon, the trillion dollar baby, I called it. Um, this is real. Yeah. So apps are moving to the cloud, value for businesses on the cloud. People are seeing accelerated timelines for shipping software. Yep. Software is eating the world, cloud is eating software, data is at the center of it. So I want to get your thoughts on this because I know that you've been talking a lot about technical debt, you know, the role of developer, cloud migration. The reality is, this is not easy. If you're doing cloud native, it's pretty easy Super if easy, that's yeah. all you got, right? So if you're a startup and or built on the cloud, you really got the wind at your back and it's looking really good. Yep. If you're not born in the cloud, you're an IT shop that you've been consolidating for years and now told to jump to a competitive advantage, you literally got to make a pivot overnight. Yeah, actually at high level, I think cloud consumption, you can divide into two buckets, right? One is the, the green field, which as you said, it's a slam dunk. Uh, all these startups are born in cloud and all these new projects, uh, systems of innovation, what, what I usually refer to those, are born in cloud and they are operated in cloud and at some point they will sort of fade away or die in cloud. But uh, the hard part is the legacy applications uh, sitting in the enterprise, right? So they, those are the trillion dollar sort of uh, what IBM folks are talking yeah. about. Uh, it, it, that's a messy problem to tackle. Uh, within that, actually, there are, there are some low hanging fruits. Of course, we can move those workloads to the cloud. I usually don't refer uh, the application, uh, the workloads as applications because uh, people are uh, sort of religiously attached to the applications. They, it's, they feel like it's their babies, right? Yeah. So I usually say workloads. So, uh, so some workloads are ripe for, for the cloud. Um, it, it's uh, data mining, uh, BI, um, and also the AI part of it, right? So, uh, but some other workloads which are not right for the work, uh, for the cloud right now, or they're hard to move, are the ERP systems, systems of record, and systems of uh, yeah. engagement, what we call CRMs and and marketing uh, sort of applications, which are yeah, legacy hard coded, ones. operationalized software frameworks and packages and vendors like Oracle. Yes, they're entrenched. The Oracle, uh, SAP, and there's so many other software vendors that have provided tons of software. Um, to the data center that is sitting there. And and, and the, the hard part is that nobody wants to pull the plug on the existing applications. I've seen that time and again. I have done, my team has done more than 100 data center audits uh, from EMC and VMware days. Um, we have seen that time and again. Nobody wants to pull the plug on the, yeah. the applications. Because they're the, running in production. They're running in production. <laughs> and, and it's hard to measure the usage of those applications also. That's a hard part of the, the sort of old stack, if you will. Yeah. So the reality is, this is kind of getting to the heart of what we wanted to talk about, which is, you know, vendor hype and market realities. Yeah. The market reality is, you can't unplug legacy apps overnight, but you got a nice thing called containers and Kubernetes emerging. That's nice. Yeah. Okay, so check, I love that. But still, the reality is, okay, then who does it? Yeah. Do I add more complexity? We just had Jerry Chen and a hot startup rock set on. They're trying to reduce the complexity by having a more simple approach. This is a hard architectural challenge. So that's it one is. fundamental thing I want to discuss with you. And then there's the practical nature of saying, assuming you get the architecture right, migrating and operating. Let's take those as separate. Let's talk architecture, then we'll talk operating and migrating. Okay. Architecturally, what do people do? What are people doing, what you're seeing? What do you think is the right architecture for a cloud architects? Because that's a booming position. Yeah. There's more and more cloud architects out there, and the openings for cloud architects is massive. Yeah. I think in architecture, the microservices are on the rise. Uh, the, 
there's a there are enabling technologies behind it. It, it, it doesn't happen all, all sort of magically o o overnight. Uh, we have had some open source uh, sort of development in that area. Uh, the RESTful APIs actually gave the birth to the microservices. Now we can easily uh, interoperate uh, between applications, right? So, uh, th and 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 our um, yeah, sort of <laughs> sorry, I'm blanking out. So our um, uh, way to divide the the compute at the sort of micro chunks from VM virtual machine to the container to the next level is the serverless, right? So that is giving birth to the microservices. And the integration technologies are improving at the same time. The problem still lies in the data, which is storage part and the data part, mm -hmm. and the network. Um, and the network is closely associated with security. So yeah. security and network are two messy parts there in the architecture. Uh, even in the pure cloud architecture in the Kubernetes world. Those yeah. are two sort of hard parts. And Cisco is trying to address the network part. I, yeah. I, I, uh, speak, I spoke to some folks there, what they're doing in, in that space. They are addressing the network and security part. Uh, uh, sort of deep and it's a good time for them to do that because yeah. I mean you go back and you know we covered DevNet Create which is Susie Wee, she's a rising star at Cisco now she's running all of DevNet. So the developer network within Cisco's has a renaissance because you know you go back 20 years ago, if you were a network guy you ran the show. <laughs> I mean everything yes. ran the network, Red network was everything. Yeah. Network dictated what would happen. Then it kind of went through a funk of like now cloud native's hot and serverless, but now that programmability is hitting the network, because remember the, the, the holy trinity of, of transformation is compute, storage, and networking. Right? Yeah, <laughs> Those aren't going away. Yeah, they're not going right? away. So networking now is seeing some you know, revitalization because you can program it. You can yeah. automate it, you can throw DevOps to it. This is kind of changing the game a little bit. So I'm in, in really intrigued by the whole network piece of it because if you can automate some network, with containers and Kubernetes and say service meshes, then it's become programmable. Then you can do the automation. Then it's then it's infrastructure as code. Yeah, I exactly. Mean, infrastructure as code has to cover all three of those things. That is true. And, and another aspect is that we talk about multi-cloud all the time, which Cisco is focusing on also, like IBM, like VMware, like many other players will talk about um, multi-cloud. But problem with the multi-cloud right now is that you cannot take the the, your security policies from one cloud provider to another and then just say, okay, run there, right? So you can do the compute, like easy yeah. containers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or Kubernetes are there. Uh, but you can't take the network as is. You cannot, mm -hmm. you can still take the storage, but not storage policies. So the policy driven computing is still not there. Yeah. So we need, um, I think, more and innovation. Some technical in that I talked to a lot of the startups and they're jumping around from Azure to Amazon. Everyone comes back to Amazon because they say, and I'm not going to name names, but I'll just, categorically say with what's going on is, when they get to Microsoft and Oracle and IBM, the old kind of guards, is they come in, they find that they check the boxes on the literature. Oh, they do this, that, and that, but it's really just a lot of reverse proxies. Yeah. There's a lot of homegrown stuff in there yeah. that are making it work and hang together, but not purely built from the ground up. Exactly, yeah, so they, they, they actually, uh, sort of rebottling the old sort of champagne kind of stuff, like they, they relabel old yeah. stuff and put layers of abstraction on top of it, and that's that's why we're having those problems with the sort of legacy vendors. So let's get into some of the things I know you're talking about a lot on Twitter. We're engaging on with the, with the community is migration, and so I want to kind of put a um, uh, context to the questions so we can riff together on it. Let's just say that you and I were hired by the the CIO of a huge enterprise, financial services. Pick your vertical. Yeah. Hey, start beating John. Fix my problems. And they give us the keys to the kingdom, bag of money, whatever it takes, go make it happen. What do we do? What's the first things that we do? Because they got legacy, we know what it looks like. You got the networks, you rack and stack, top of rack switches, you got perimeter based security. We got to go in and kind of level the playing field. What's our strategy? What do we what do we recommend? Yeah, the first thing first, right? So first we need to know the drivers for the migration, right? What is it? Is it the cost cutting? Is it the agility? Is it um, um, merger and acquisitions? So, what are the diff what are what is the main driver? So that knowing that actually will help us like uh, uh, divvy up the problem, actually divide it up. Uh, the next thing, the b next best practice is that I always always suggest I've done uh, quite a few migrations is that do the application portfolio analysis first. You want to find the low hanging fruit uh, which can be moved to the cloud first. 
the reason, main reason behind that is that, that your people and processes need to ease into using the cloud. I use, uh, I use con uh, consumption uh, term a lot actually on, yeah. on Twitter, you see yeah. that. So I'm a big fan of consumption economics. Um, so your people and processes need to adapt mm -hmm like your change control, change man management, ITSM, the old, old stuff still wa is valid actually. We, we're giving it a new name, but does those problems don't, get, don't go, go away, right? Mm -hmm. How you log a ticket, how, you, how the sport will react and all that stuff. So it needs to map to the cloud. SLA is another um, um, less talked about topic in our circles on Twitter and, and our industry pundits don't talk about it. Yeah. But that's an, another interesting part, like a, what are the SLAs needed for which applications and so forth. So first do the application profiling, uh, find the low hanging fruit, go slow in the beginning, create the phases, like phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, and it also depends number on the number of applications, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, IBM folks were talking about that thousand average number of applications per enterprise. I think it's more than thousand. I've seen it, um, and that uh, just divvy up the problem, and then migrate. Uh, another best practice I've learned is migrate as is. Do not transform and migrate, because then you add, if something is not working over there or the performance problem or any latency latency problem, uh, you will blame it on the on the um, uh, your newer architecture, if you will. Move as is, yeah. then then transform over there. Uh, and if you want to get me to elaborate a little more on the transformation part, uh, I usually divide transformation into three buckets. Actually, this is what I tell the CIOs and CTOs and CI CEOs, uh, that transformation is of three types. Well, after you move, transformation, mm -hmm. is, first it is the infrastructure-led transformation. You can do replatforming and go from Windows to Linux and Linux to AIX and all that stuff. Like you can go from yeah. uh, VM to, to container kind of stuff, right? And the second is a process-led transformation, which is that you change your uh, change control, change management, policy-driven computing, if you will, mm -hmm. so you create automation there. Uh, the third thing is the application where you open the hood of the application and refactor the code and so do the web service enablement of your application so that you can weave in the systems of innovation and plug those into the existing application. So you want to open your application, that's the whole idea behind all this sort of transformation is mm -hmm. your application are open. So you yeah. can bring in the data and, and take out the data. Uh, as From your you conversations think. and analysis, how does cloud, once migrations happen, cloud operations, how does that impact traditional network network architecture, network security, and application performance? Um, on the network side, actually, uh, how does it, let me re, um, ask you a question. What do you mean by, how does it? Uh, in the old days, you used to provision like older VLAN. Stuff? So I got networks out there, yeah. I got a big enterprise, okay, got, we know how to run the networks. Yeah. But now I'm moving to the cloud. Yeah. I'm off premises, I'm on prem. Premise, and now I'm in the cloud. Yeah. How do I think about the networks differently? Who's provisioning the local, uh, the subnets? Who's doing the VPNs? You know, where's the policy? All these policy-based things that we're starting to see at Kubernetes. Yeah. That were traditionally like network you stuff is now happening at the microservices level. Yeah. So new so paradigm. The new paradigm, actually, the the, the whole idea is that the, that your network folks, or your storage folks, your server folks, like what they used to be in, in house, they need to be able to program. Right, so that's that's number one uh, thing. So you need to retrain your workforce, right? If you don't have the, re re you cannot retrain people overnight, yeah. and then you bring in some folks who know how to program networks and then bring those in. There's a big misconception uh, about, um, from people that um, the service, uh, sorry, the service provider, which is called mm -hmm. cloud service provider, is responsible for the security of your applications or for the network sort of sort of segmentation of your network uh, of your network they are not actually they don't have any liability over security if you read the SLAs it's your responsibility to uh, have the, the sort of right firewalling right uh, checks and balances in place for the network for storage for compute right policies in place it, it's your responsibility so let's talk about the um some some tweets you've been doing because I've been I've been one of the pull of the ones that I like. You, uh, you tweeted a couple of days ago. We don't know how to recycle failed startups. Yeah. Okay, and I said open source, yeah. and you picked up and wrote up another um, uh, image. Op is open source a dumping ground for failed startups? And it was interesting because what I love about open source is in the old days of proprietary software, if the company went under, the code went under with it. 
but at least now with open source, at least something can survive. But you bring up this dumping concept that also came up in an interview earlier today with another guest, which was with all this contribution coming in from vendors, is it's almost like there's a dumping going on into open source in general. You can't miss a beat without five new announcements per day that's, you know, someone's contributing their software from this project or and, or failed, even failed startup, you know, last hope, let's open source it. Is that good or bad? I mean, what's your take on that? What was your, what was your um, posture or thinking around this conversation? Is it good? Is it bad? Um, I, yeah, I, I believe it's an it, it, it's economic problem, economics thing, right? So, so when it, somebody's like a proprietary model doesn't work, they say, okay, let, let, me, let me see if this works. Right, actually, they always go first with the, like, okay, let me make money. Start, like, we make money, right? Uh, higher right. margin, right? Everybody loves that, right? But then, if they cannot penetrate the market, they say, okay, let me make it open source, right? And then I will uh, get the money from the sport or, or or my own distro. Like, distros are a big, like, open source killer. I said that a few times. Like, like vendor specific distributions of open source, they they kill uh, open source like nothing else does. Because um, I was at Rackspace when we open sourced uh, OpenStack, and I saw what happened to OpenStack. It, it was like eye opening. So everybody kind of hijacked the OpenStack and started putting their own sort of flavors yeah. in, in place. Yeah, we saw the outcome of that. Yeah, it niched into infrastructure as a service, kind of has special purpose built view. And, 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 and when it comes cloud native, didn't help either. Cloud grew exactly. at that time too. Talk about two thousand and you know eight time frame. Yeah, yeah. And exactly, and another, why I said that was it, it was in a different context. Actually, I invested some money into an incubator in Berkeley, uh, the Battery. So uh, we have taken about 70 plus startups through that program so far. Um, and I've seen that pattern there. So yeah. I, will, I will interview the, the people who want to bring their startup to our incubator and all that. And then after, uh, some, most of them fail, right? They fade, yeah. kind of fade away. Uh, uh, or they leave, they definitely leave our incubator after a certain number of weeks, but then you see like what what happens to them. And now I'm also living in the valley, you can't avoid it. <laughs> I worked with 500 startups a little bit, and used to go to their demo days from the Rackspace days because we used to have a deal with them, uh, marketing deal. So um, the the pattern I saw that was like there's a lot of innovation, there's a lot of brain power. Uh, in these startups that we don't know what, to, these people just fade away. They, we, we don't have a mechanism to say, okay, hey, you are doing this and we are also doing similar stuff. We are a little more successful. Than we. Let's merge these two things and, and make it yeah. work. So we, we don't know how to recycle the startups. It's almost, That's a, that it's was almost a personal network of intellectual capital. Yeah, kind of. There needs to be a new way to network in the IP that's in people's heads. Or in this case, if it's open source, that's easy there too. So making it accessible. So there's no startup no, there's no internet of startups, if you will. Yeah. So there's no. Well, hey, we said, hey, you start a cube group. <laughs> You'll do it. Start a crowd check. All right. I want to ask you about this consumption economics. Yeah. Um, I like this concept. Can you take a minute to explain what you mean by consumption economics? You said you're all over it. I know you talk a lot about it on Twitter. Yes. What is it about? Why is it important? Uh, actually, the pattern I've seen uh, in, in, in tech industry for the last 25, 24 years or so in, in Silicon Valley, so the pattern I've seen is that everybody focuses on the supply side. Like we do this, we like oh, we're going to change the way you work and all that stuff. But people usually do not uh, focus on the consumption side of things, like how people are consuming things. I'm a great fan of um, um, a theory called jobs to be done theory. Um, if you get a time, take a look at that. So what jobs people are trying to do uh, and, and how you can solve that problem. Actually, if you approach it, your product services from that, that sort of angle, that goes a long way. Another, another aspect I talk about the, the consumption economics is it's age of micro consumption. And, and again, there are reasons behind it. The main reason is there's so much thrown at us individually and, and also yeah. enterprise-wise. Like so much technology is thrown at us if we try to batch, like if we try to say, okay, we're not going to consume the technology now and we're going to uh, do every six months, like we're going to release every six months or uh, new software or new packages, and also at the same time we're going to consume uh, every six months, that doesn't work. So the, so the whole notion when I talk about the micro consumption is that you keep bringing the change in micro chunks. And I think AWS has mastered the game of yeah. micro supply, as a micro supplier of that micro yeah. change, if you will. So they release. And by the way, they're very customer centric, so listening to the demand side. Exactly. 
So they, they kind of walk uh, ha hand in hand with the customer in a way that customer wants this and they're need, needing this, so let's, let's, let us release it. They don't wait for the like, old traditional model of like, okay, every year there's a new big release and, the, and, and there are service packs and patches and all that stuff. Even though other vendors have moved uh, sort of uh, along mm -hmm. the industry, but they still have longer cycles. They still release like 10 things at a, at a time. I think that doesn't work. So you have to give, as a supplier, or to, the, to the message to the oracles of the world and HPs and IBMs, give the change in smaller chunks. Um, uh, don't give them monolithic. Uh, when you're marketing your stuff, uh, mar even ma marketing message yeah. should be in micro chunks. Like, oh, even if you created like five sort of features in, sort of, let's say in Watson, Right, just give them one at a time. Uh, be developer friendly, because developers are the, the people who will consume that stuff. Yeah, and then making it more supply, less supply side, but micro chunks or micro services or micro supply. Yeah. Um, having a developer piece also plays well, because they're also ones who can help assemble the micro, it's in the Lego model of con composability. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so I think that's definitely right. The other thing I want to get your thoughts on is, validated by Jerry Chen and Greylock and his hot startups and a few others, is my notion of stack overhaul. The changes in the stack are significant. I tweeted and you commented on it uh, when, on the Red Hat IBM deal, because uh, they were talking about, oh, the IBM stack is going to be everywhere, and, and they're talking about the IBM stack and the old full stack developer model. But if you look at the consumption economics, you look at horizontally scalable cloud native serverless and all those things going on with Kubernetes. The trend is a complete radical shifting of the stack, where now the standardization is the horizontally scalable and then the differentiation is at the top of the stack. So you, the stack is tweaked and torqued it a little bit. Yeah. And so this is going to change a lot. Your thoughts and reaction to that concept of stack, not, not a complete you know, radical wholesale yeah. change, but a tweak. It's, it, the, this actually, our, our CTO at Rackspace, uh, John Gates, gave us a, a, a sort of uh, a speech at one of the con conferences here in, in the Bay Area. The, the title of that was Stack, What Stack, right? So the point he was trying to make was like stack is like, a, we are not in the blue stack, red stack anymore. So we are the across stack, actually. There are a lot of the sort of small Lego, Lego pieces. We are trying to put those together, and again, the reason behind that is because of some enabling technology like yeah. web services and, and RESTful APIs. So those have enabled and us And new to kinds of glue layers, if you will, yeah, extraction yeah. layers. Yeah, I call it digital glue. Yeah. So there's a new type of digital glue and now we, have, we are yeah. seeing the emergence of low code, no code sort of paradigms uh, coming into the play, um, which is a long debate in, in itself. Uh, so, so they are changing the stack altogether. So everything is becoming kind of lightweight, if you will. Uh, yeah. Again, and more the level of granularity is getting, you know, thinner and thinner, not macro. So, you know, yeah. macro services doesn't exist. That was, my, I think, my tweet. <laughs> yes. You know, macro services or micro services. Yeah. Which one you think's better? Yeah, and exactly. you know, we know what's happening with micro services. That is the trend. That is the trend. So that is that antithesis of macro. Yeah. Or or monolithic. Yeah. So uh, there's a there's a saying in tech actually I, I, I will rephrase it I don't know exactly how that is uh, so we actually tend to overestimate the, the in, impact of a technology in the short run and under underestimate in the long term right so there's a famous uh, saying somebody said that and uh, that's I think that's so true what we actually wanted to do after the dot com bust uh, was the the object oriented like the 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 sort of black box uh, services it, we call them web services back then right. Yeah. Uh, there were books written by IBM. Service oriented architecture, yes, web SOA, services, yeah. RSS came out of that. Yes. I mean, a lot of good things that are actually in part of what the vision is happening today. It's happening now, actually. It's just happening today. And and mobile has changed everything, I, I, I believe. Not only on the consumer side, even on the on. on I mean, that's literally side. 16, 17 years later. Yes, it's exactly. It took a gestation that long. period. Yes. Bitcoin, 10 years ago, yesterday, the white yeah. paper was built. Yeah. So the acceleration is certainly happening. I know you're a big fan of blockchain. You've been tweeting about it lately. Um, thoughts on blockchain? What's your what's your view on blockchain? Um, real? Going to have a big impact? I think it will have a huge impact. Actually, I, I, I've been studying on it. Actually, I was light on it. Now I'm a little bit. I'm reading on it, this and understand. I've talked to people who are doing this work. Uh, I think it will have a huge impact. Actually, the problem right now with blockchain is that 
that, that speed, right? Slow so down, yeah, yeah, it's very slow, dock slow, if you will. Uh, but I think that is a technical problem. We, will, we can solve that. Mm -hmm. There's no uh, sort of uh, functional problem with the blockchain. Actually, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. Another aspect which come into play is the data sovereignty. So blockchains actually are replicated throughout the world. If you want the worldwide money exchange and all that kind of stuff going around, uh, we, we, will, we will need to address that because the data in Switzerland needs to sit there and data in the U.S. needs to sit in the U.S. That, that blockchain actually kind of, yeah. it doesn't do that. It, it, you have a copy of the same data everywhere. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you talk about digital software-defined money, software-defined data center. I mean, it's all digital. I mean, someone once said, uh, whatever gets digitized grows exponentially. <laughs> oh, that was you. <laughs> actually, that was I, on October 30th. That was, that came from a, a book actually. It's called Exponential Organizations. Actually, there are two great books I will recommend for everybody to read. Actually, there's a third one also. So <laughs> the two are, one is Exponential Organizations. It's a pretty thin yeah. book. You should take, pick it up. And uh, it, it talks about uh, like what, whatever get digitized uh, um, grows expo exponentially, but our organizations are not ha like geared towards handling that exponential growth. And the other one is Consumption Economics. The title of the book is Consumption Economics. Consumption economics, actually I saw that book after yeah. I started talking about uh, yeah. consumption economics myself. Yeah. I'm an economics major actually, yeah. so that's why I talk about that kind of stuff uh, in yeah. those kind of economics. Well, I terms. think one of the things, I mean we've talked about this privately when we've seen each other at some of the CUBE uh, events, um, I think economics, the, s the chief economic officer role will be a title that will be as powerful as a CISO, chief security officer, because consumption economics, token economics, which is the crypto kind of dynamic of gamification yep. or network effects. You got economics and cloud, you got all kinds of new dynamics that are now instrumented that need, that are they're throwing off numbers. So there's math behind things, whether it's cryptocurrency, whether it's math behind reputation or any, anything. Yeah, Math is driving everything. Machine learning, heavy math oriented, algorithms. Yeah, actually at, at the end of the day, economics matters. Right, that's what we are all trying to do, right? We're trying to do uh, things faster, cheaper, right? That's what automation yeah. is all about. And Sim simplifying too. And simplifying. You can't throw complexity at more complexity. Yeah. That's exponential S complexity. Some, sometimes we, while we are trying to simplify things, and I also said like many times, the tech is like medicine, right? <laughs> I've said that t many times. Like, tech is like medicine, every pill has a side effect. Yeah. Sometimes when we are trying to simplify stuff, we add more complexity. Yeah. So. Um, What's worse, the pain or the side effect? Yeah. Pick your pick your yeah. thing. You pick your thing, and your your goal is to uh, sort of reduce the side effects. They will be there. They will be there, and, and what is digital transformation? It's all about business. It's not less about technology. Technology is a small piece of that. It's more about business models, right? So we're trying to when we talk when we talk about micro consumption and and the sharing economy. They're yeah. kind of similar concepts, right? So Ubers yes. of the world and Airbnb of the world. So those new business models have been enabled by technology and we want to replicate that with the medicine, with the, with the I guess, uh, education, autos, and you name it. So, so we obviously believe in micro content. Okay, we've got the Clipper tool, <laughs> search engine. I love that. So the Cubanomics, it's a book that we should be getting. Yeah, right we should away. do that. Yeah. Cubanomics, Cubanomics, economics behind yeah. the Cuban interviews. Sarbi, thank you for coming on, great to see you. and. Thank you for your Thanks, participation and, and engagement online in our digital community. We love chatting with you and always great to see you. And uh, let's talk more about economics and digital exponential growth. It's certainly happening. Thanks for coming yeah. in. Appreciate it. was great it. having you. All right, great. Being All right. here. Actually. All right, this is the Cube Conversation here in Palo Alto Studios here for the Cube headquarters. I'm John Furrier. Thanks for watching.